You have learned there's two types of people in the world. There are dog people. Those that love those loyal and faithful animals that will rescue their owners that are in despair. And there are cat people. Those that love the abuse of that feline that is selfish and thinks about itself. As you can tell, not a cat person. Grew up with dogs in my household. Loved my dogs growing up. We now have a dog now. I tolerate. I'm dog tolerant, as I would say. I appreciate animals. I don't love them. I know people are. I'm, I'm, I'm not making a lot of friends in the start of this Easter message. However, my grandmother remarried, and my step-grandfather was a cat person. You ever met the cat lady on your street? You know her? She's there, thousands of cats. He was the cat man of our neighborhood. And he literally just welcomed all strays like a Pied Piper into the house. And we would go and spend the night at my grandparents' house, and there would be just random feral cats everywhere. But luckily, they had property, so they were often in the garage. But there was one of the feral cats that was allowed inside the house, and that was a white furry cat called Mutza. Now, my uh, grandfather was Romanian. I pray that that's not an offensive term in Romanian. So again, if you translate that right now, I do apologize. But Mutza the cat was part of the family. So you would regularly find Mutza as he would jump up on the table. He would eat your food. He was one of those cats. Well, Mutza had this habit of bringing dead animals into the house. And it became this regular game we would, we would play. My grandmother would say, we smell something in the house. Mutza's probably brought in a mouse, a bird, a squirrel, something of that nature. And we'd find these dead carcasses throughout the house and have to discard of them. This was the adventures of Mutza the cat. Well, again, it was one Easter Sunday, beautiful Easter. It was a 1990s Easter. Anybody remember those? I love the 90s Easter. I was seven. My brother was four. Uh, he was really an amazing kid. He's in China right now. He's a full-time missionary today. Uh, but my brother and I have a very close relationship. But it was a perfect Sunday. We went to church. We wore our Easter best. We had our clip-on bow ties. It was amazing. We go to my grandmother's house. And again, if you remember the 80s and 90s Easter, it's very different than today. Today, we have the Food Network. I guarantee that you're probably bringing something that looks amazing with some microgreens on top, maybe some pomegranate kernels around it. It's going to look incredible with your raspberry reduction. That was not the 90s. In the 90s, you would go to Easter, and everybody would bring hodgepodge things. And they were hoping that maybe they watched Julia Child that week. But most likely, they would bring the same recipe they would always have. So you'd have the one relative that would bring the overly salty deviled eggs. You know these? We have the run relative that brings the potato salad with too much pickle juice. And you're always asking because they're really proud that it's real mayonnaise. And it's not Miracle Whip. But everybody's concerned for how long it's been sitting unrefrigerated on the picnic table outside. With those black olives with you know are not real olives inside of them. And then grandma brings out that beautiful gelatinous ham from that can. Do you remember this? And you would scrape the gelatin off the top. And then dessert would come. And it was Jello Jigglers. Those were legendary. And these Jello Jigglers are not like today. We had real food coloring back then. Red 40 was part of the diet in the 90s. High fructose corn soap. We drink that stuff for breakfast. Sunny delight. So we have this 1990s Easter. It's amazing. But it all sets the table. For the egg hunt. Now, the modern generation, God bless my kids, I love them. They know nothing of the egg hunts of the 80s and 90s. They get these plastic shiny eggs with candy inside, dollar bills and quarters. Our prize was an egg. <laughs> you would smash that egg, you would eat that white, you'd throw salt on that yolk. That was your reward in the 90s. So we would take these eggs, we would decorate them on Saturday, we would take that food coloring, you would take that vinegar, and they, a perfect egg was multicolored with so much vinegar, it would burn your hands. That's how you knew a real egg was made. So we made these Easter eggs and we would hide them throughout the house. 
So really the game we played was you would know the amount of eggs that you were hiding and you would go and find them, but the person that hid them, if the people could not find the eggs, you would then get the points for the eggs that were not discovered. So I was a master at hiding these. And again, my grandmother's house had all those weird antiques. We had that freaky monkey that would hang out in the corner. We had all those strange things in the house. It was a perfect house to hide things in. So we'd hide all these eggs. So again, I was champion of the 1990 Easter egg hunt that day. So it got late. I ended up spending the night at my grandparents' house with my brother. Well, we'd stay in this room next to the living room. So I'm woken up frantically by my grandmother. She says, there was a dead animal in the house. I said, what? what? Grandma, I don't know. Mutz has dragged something in, and it's the foulest smell we've ever smelled in the house. We have to find where this animal is. So I get up and wake up my brother. So I stumble in the room, and we're looking around, and then I remember. I hid an egg underneath the sofa. <laughs> and this is, again, a couple-day-old egg. So by the time it's, it's really ripened, it's, it's really brought the fragrance of the Lord into the house. <laughs> so we go into the living room and I look around and I wait till my grandmother's distracted and look underneath the sofa. Sure enough, here's this festering egg. I pull it out, go up to my grandmother. Grandma, it's not an animal. I found the smell. I put it before her and she says, who did this? I said, Grandma. I'm so sorry, and like any good brother, I said, you know, I think Preston hit it under that, <laughs> that couch. But let's give him grace. Remember, it's Easter. <laughs> See, in our culture, we have an adverse reaction to death. We have this response to things that are decaying, things that are deteriorating. When we're around them, very rarely will we ever see a dead body. Maybe if you go to the morgue or you go to a funeral, but if you walk around, we don't see dead things. We've all had those experiences where maybe an animal was dead in the road and within a few hours it will be removed. Or if you're in your neighborhood and you find an animal that's been injured or wounded, you quickly call animal patrol and it's gone within hours. Now, in the first century, death was common. Death was something you were around day in and day out. Regularly, people would die in the streets. There was illness and disease. You literally never knew if that day would be your last day. You could be walking to the market, and you'd be jumped by marauders. And next thing you know, a family member or a loved one had died. Regularly, you would go to funerals and different ceremonies celebrating the dead. However, there was one symbol of death that was never discussed. In a culture that was acquainted with death, that understood the cost of life, there was one word that was rarely uttered, and that was the word crucifixion. Now, crucifixion was something everyone would see. You would walk down the streets, especially if you lived near Rome, and you would find family members, neighbors, rare acquaintances hanging on the side of the road as their carcasses were eaten by birds of prey. This was common, but you would never say the word crucifixion. You would never reference the cross because now we know in modern times it would promote a post-traumatic stress disorder response. Because when you would mention crucifixion, when you would mention a cross, even drawing the symbol, you immediately would remember those you knew that had died in such a horrific way. This method of death, of capital punishment, was designed by the Romans. And they used it as a symbol for anybody that rebelled against Rome. Anyone that created some type of revolution, you were made an example of. And not just yourself, your family as well. So this was common in the culture. We now have this movement taking place where a man named Jesus, who is just a carpenter's son. Everyone knew that he lived this moral life, but he lived in relative obscurity. What we would know now and many believe is most likely his father, Joseph, passed away when he was quite young and as the oldest of the family, as he had brothers and sisters beneath him, he became the head of the house and he took over his father's business. Well, one day, he starts to stand in the city center, a place called Galilee, and he makes this announcement. He says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Now, 
If you were to read the Gospels, you would read this and not think much of that statement. However, in that moment, that was what we call a messianic claim or someone that said they were the chosen one of Israel. Now, as we are removed from that culture, we don't know how many times these messianic claims took place. And what we would study from history is there were several revolts in the first century. We had many people that claimed to be this Messiah. And what you would do is you would gather an army. You would then make relationship with the political leaders of the time, these Pharisees and these Sadducees. You would assemble your men and you would make your assault against Rome. The cost of that assault, if unsuccessful, was crucifixion. We now have several men that have been crucified. Now Jesus makes this claim and it gets everyone's attention. But instead of picking the political elite, instead of picking those that would be strong in an army, he chooses fishermen, tax collectors as his team. He then starts to gather tax collectors and prostitutes as part of his team. And they're eating dinner with him. And they're defiling the community, the Pharisees say. And as he's holding these dinners, the Pharisees, these religious leaders of the time, start to bring accusation against him. They said, how can you defile these homes with these meals? He says, listen, it's not the well that are in need of a physician. It's the sick. And behold, I've come to seek and save the lost. So Jesus creates this movement, and on top of these dinners he's having there's healings taking place and miracles that are moving and he's fulfilling all of these old prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel about this one that would come and liberate Israel from the darkness of death and as he is having this tremendous movement he makes his way to Jerusalem and there's rumors of him being abducted and murdered that are starting to circulate. And the disciples say, Jesus, you can't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you must, you're going to die. They say, listen, two days I'll be down. The third day I'll rise. And they say, we have no idea what you're talking about. You ever watch Star Wars? You ever see Luke with Yoda? That was Jesus and his disciples. <laughs> so Jesus would make these statements and they say, okay, so now these disciples, they think that this kingdom movement's about to happen as they go into Jerusalem, that Jesus is taking back this community for Yahweh out from under Roman rule. So they're making their moves, hoping they can sit at his left and right hand in this kingdom. Well, a night starts to form. It's a famous feast called Passover. And as Passover starts to form, as things start to mature and move, he says, I want you guys to go prepare a room. There's going to be this room ready for us. He goes up to this room, and he has the Passover feast. In the midst of the feast, he starts to teach and says, this is my body broken for you. And then they eat it, and, and, and they're perplexed. He then takes the wine and says, this is the blood of my new covenant. Covenant, I, I, I give it to you guys to, to, to purify you of your sins. And then he says, one of you are going to betray me. I mean, this is a strange conversation. They've had two Passovers with Jesus. This is not a normal Passover. And as they're there that night, he then goes and secludes himself in a garden. And he says, make sure you pray so you don't fall into temptation. And they're like, Jesus had too much wine tonight. He went a little heavy on the communion, Jesus. And as he's there, all of a sudden, Judas comes with these guards. And a night they would never forget takes place. As he's beaten and maligned, they're all afraid for their lives because they have seen what happens to people that lead revolutions. They knew that if they were associated with him, their death would be his crucifixion. So they quickly scatter. Jesus is left alone. Only people that stay around him are these women. As he's put on trial, he's beaten and he's bruised. He's bled out. 
He's on this cross, but it's, it's a really dicey moment because it's their most holy day. This is Passover Eve. And this is the day where they celebrate the exodus from Egypt. And as he's there, he's dying. They say, you can't leave him up on the cross. He's dead. He's dead because normally they would leave them longer. And they say, you know, we'll make sure he's dead. And they pierce his side and it punctures the sack underneath his heart and blood and water come out showing that he was truly dead. Now we have to remember Rome was really good at one thing and that was execution. So they take him and they say, please let us bury him. And there's this man named Joseph of Arimathea that brings this tomb out and shows them that he's prepared this place for those Old Testament junkies, it's this really weird symbolism about the bones of Joseph being carried out from the Exodus, if you capture that. They put him into this tomb, and he's dead, but they can't finish the burial. They can't finish the process because sundown has happened and the Sabbath has started. So these women, now left alone, disregarded by family and friends because they've pleaded allegiance to Jesus and those they would look to for leadership being these disciples have all left. They go and have the most dire Passover anyone could imagine because their friend, their leader has been brutally murdered with no accusation. He dies with a symbol above his head that says King of the Jews. Sunday morning happens, and they, and they walk in on this first day, and you can imagine the grief that they would be under. Tremendous grief, tremendous sorrow that they would hold. And as they walk to finish this procession, here's what takes place in verse 1 of chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. Now, you'd have to remember at this time, there was most likely a Roman guard that would have been there. And when they come to this tomb door that is now rolled away, grief strikes them yet Again, their friend, Jesus' body has been defiled. It's been stolen. And you walk in there, and when you think things can't get worse, it does. Just imagine the sorrow. Imagine going to a loved one's funeral to find an empty casket. Imagine going to your friend's funeral to pay respects and to prepare them for burial and they're not there because someone stole it. And they walk out bewildered and devastated and poor and they see two men. These aren't normal men. They're so bright, they, they don't understand. It's not dawn any longer. And they can't see. And as they look up, they, they have to bow because they think that they've died. It's the only context they would have is, is what have we seen here? Are we now dead and we don't even realize it? And they bow to the ground and these men say, listen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. The man you're looking for, Jesus. He's risen. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you looking for dead things or live things are what you're called to find? And they're so overwhelmed and shocked by this because they know that this isn't an act and they run to the disciples and say, Jesus is alive. Peter quickly runs back and as he's there, he goes and he says, I don't understand. And we then see this unfolding that words really don't do justice where these appearances happen. Where as Jesus shows up, terror strikes them. And they see him in this resurrected form. They don't have words to describe it. They say, Jesus, where have you gone? And Mark says it well. When the angels encounter these witnesses, he says, 
You seek Jesus of Nazareth. Behold, he's dead. He's now been made alive. See, the Jesus they knew, the weak and feeble, meek man that they knew that healed the sick but yet was bruised and maligned by guards is now a resurrected king. And as they stand, they, they, they want to approach him, but they don't know how. And then they realize it's the same Jesus they hung out with for three years. And he says, I go and I give you power and authority I'm giving you what I have. Go and make disciples of all nations. And they are in, in, in enraged by this message. They become what they call messengers or what we would now know as evangelists. And they start to share this story. Now, they say this great phrase in the book of Acts, whereas the Hebrews get together, the Jewish priests get together, and they say, hey, listen, if this is really of God, It'll happen. It'll continue. But most of these things died down. But guess what? It continued and moved forward beyond Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And now tribes are giving their lives to Jesus. And the same power that Jesus had is present in those that follow him. And Rome now gets angry. Rome's now affected by this because guess what? People aren't pledging allegiance to Caesar any longer. And when you start messing with people's money, oh, you get their attention. As they have this rebellion form, they begin to put the same assault like they did on Jesus onto these people. And you can read stories where thousands of crucifixes of believers were hung, and yet it continued to spread. It continued to move forward. All the way up until 300, where Constantine, the emperor, pledges pledges allegiance to Jesus. Before this, Christianity was illegal. Rodney Stark, one of the chief historians of the early centuries, says that nearly 51% of the Roman Empire had given allegiance to Jesus. This is a movement words can't describe. Now, the early leaders had a problem. They now had all these people that didn't know the story of Israel. But Jesus is this Jewish king. He's the Messiah, this king of the world. How do we educate them? So what do we do? So they say, hey, you know, Jesus didn't abolish the Passover. What we should do is we should use the Passover to show the story of Jesus and how he is the Lamb of God sacrificed for us. Because in the story of Passover, there is the blood of a lamb put over these doorposts so that the the cloud of death, the angel of death would pass over these families. So they started to educate them. Now all these Gentiles, these non-Jews are joining the Passover feasts. Now, if you were a traditionalist, if you were a Jew, you have major problems with this. Because Gentiles have no part in the celebration. And they would teach how Jesus was at the center of this. And I can see in your eyes right now, you're like, is he making up really good stories right now? Is he just preaching something so we believe him by the end? Well, what we learn is this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We have this really unique passage, and and Paul, as he writes this letter to this church community, he's educating them on the history of of Israel and the history of the Exodus. Well, how many have been a part, I'll just be honest here, of a difficult or dysfunctional church situation before? Just lift your hand up for me right now. Many of you have been, I've been at the Rock for a long time, dysfunctional, yes, (laughs) just kidding. No, we, we've all exposed that. Or maybe how many of you have ever been hurt by a church leader in some way? You've seen dysfunction in the life of a church leader in some way. Now, I want you to take that experience, times it by 10, and that's the church at Corinth. This is one of the most dysfunctional churches you will ever read about in history. I mean, it's so bad that people are... Again, sons are then meeting and dating their father's concubines. This is a weird world that's going on. 
is so bad that people are coming in and they're eating feasts and getting drunk on communion and saying they're blessed by God and they're ostracizing the poor. This is a rough scenario. What's happening is the power of God's showing up at the same time. So Paul has to bring this massive correction. But right in the middle of his letter, his first letter, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, he says this, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And what we find is that they use Passover as this education tool for all these new converts. And Passover now becomes a part of the Greco-Roman culture. They give it this name. It's Pasha, and you can find this throughout Greek Orthodox history where this now becomes the chief celebration of the spring. This now becomes what we would know as today, Easter. They celebrate the Passover and they show how Jesus has restored all things through his sacrifice. Now this leads us to this great question. If Passover is Easter, what's on earth with all the bunnies? and chocolate eggs. And see, what we learn is this, is that Easter, and again, if you talk to friends that don't go to church, like, why are you celebrating Easter? Don't you know it's just another pagan holiday? They're actually right. Uh-oh, here's the Oz curtain. Easter was a pagan holiday. And we find that there's these writings of Easter all the way up until the year 800. And they originate in Germany. So as these writings come out, and they would celebrate Easter, the East Star, and as they would have this, it was a celebration of fertility and new life. It was when the noon or the daylight met the darkness, and the hours were perfect, and they would follow the solstice. They would follow the sun calendar. Here's a picture of the goddess that they would worship at the time, the goddess of fertility. So with this, she had lilies and bunnies and eggs. Well, Germany is an unreached people group. People have very little success reaching Germany. Until one day, a man named Winfred was very rich. His dad was incredibly rich. He forfeits all of his wealth to become a priest. And he says, God has called me to Germany. Upon sacrificing his wealth, he moves to Germany. Here's a painting of this man. His name was changed to Boniface. Now, as you look here... He's the only patron saint with a weapon in his hand. <laughs> now, this weapon wasn't because he was really into horror movies in the 800s. It was actually a pretty profound story or turning in history. See, he found that they would all worship this god named Donar at this oak tree. Now, it wasn't an oak tree like many of us would know today, Here's a picture of a community oak in front of a house. See, the Donar oak was so powerful and so expansive, they believed it had magical powers. Now, we don't have a picture of it, obviously, today. This is thousands of years ago, or over a 1,000 years old. But here is most likely what it would look like today. Here's the angel oak. It was this massive tree with mystical powers in which they would offer human sacrifice to their god, Donar, a Viking god. You know him today as Thor. <laughs> so the Thor oak is what they really worshipped. So Chris Hemsworth would make his appearances. Just kidding. So he goes before them, and he's having little success and one day he gets so fed up, he picks up an axe, walks to the tree and says, listen, if your God's real, let him strike me dead with lightning. If he's not, I'm cutting this tree down. And he chops the tree down. He doesn't die. They think he's a God. He then takes the wood and builds a church and says, give your life to Jesus. And they do. So it's so prominent that the East Star 
Celebration is the same time as Passover, and the names become synonymous. Out of nowhere, this mystical goddess of fertility, they say the celebration ceases in history after 800. It goes away because they start to worship Jesus. Fast forward to modern day. We see that Easter is Passover. That's a celebration of the resurrection and life of Jesus. But it's not till a magical invention in the late 1800s by two brothers in England called the Brothers Cadbury. <laughs> they invent the chocolate Easter egg. And we now see the commercialization of Easter. Shortly afterwards... They create postcards in Germany. Here's a picture of one of the first postcards that were sent. And of course, they were sent at Easter time. We then see this nexus of Easter form because we realize in the Industrial Revolution, we can make money off of holidays. And guess what? Crucifixes don't sell pretty well on cards. Easter bunnies and eggs it is. And we see this synergy with the pagan festival yet again and the Christian belief. And over time, we see that this crucifixion that was so jarring in the first century now just becomes culturally common. And now Jesus, when we think of him, we think of Jesus as our homeboy, like the shirt says. <laughs> or we think of Jesus as just another cool meme that you find on Facebook, like this. I like Nine Inch Nails before they were a band. Jesus. Here's another one. How about this one? I went to go out clubbing on my birthday, and everywhere I went, it was closed. Jesus. Christmas. Get it? There you go. Here's one more. Let's this one. Need an ark? I know a guy. <laughs> we then take our religious figure, our God, that we believe is king and rose again from the dead. And guess what? Jesus also likes to make appearances on pop culture TV shows like The Simpsons. Here we go right here. What would Jesus brew? In which Homer then goes to make a mockery of the crucifixion. Or our good friend Will Ferrell on SNL playing the Jesus guy. See, we've seen this commercialization of Jesus, but we have to understand something that's really important about our faith. See, we've presented Jesus in this picture-perfect way that if you add Jesus into your life, things will get better. And oh, no, 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 make sure you say a prayer so you don't get burned in the fire by that pitchfork devil downstairs. But here's the deal. We've made the culture okay with Jesus' humanity in the absence of his holiness. made everything cool. That Jesus is okay. He's a great guy. He's a moral teacher. But here's a problem. All the moral teachers of the past, Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad, none of them claim to come back to life. None of them led revolutions that took over the world without violence. Something happened that day we can't explain. And let me just let you in on a little secret. The disciples weren't killed because Jesus was kind. They believed he was king. And it comes to this point today. We look at the story of Jesus. We look at this resurrection story. Jesus isn't hoping that you leave today saying a prayer so that you're safe when you're dead. He says eternal life is for now, not later. Eternal life and relationship with him is for right now. He wants you to know him. He wants you to be aligned with him. And the pain and the darkness and the death that you've experienced can only be distinguished by him. It's really important for us to understand. Now, again, I can give some great reasons as to why the resurrection happened and give you some history, but I'll just let you know, 
A great lecture doesn't change a life. An encounter with the risen king does. And until you encounter the presence of God, I can convince you till you're blue in the face and then you'll open up a podcast by Sam Harris tomorrow and think something different. But what I can offer you is an invitation to the restored life and restoration that Jesus offers. And that's what today is about. God is love, but he wants you to make him your Lord. And that means giving allegiance over to him. We've all heard the first before, Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that you're saved, confess that Jesus is Lord, and you'll go to heaven, right? What we cut out is the key crux of that verse is lordship. The confession of lordship is what you would give to Caesar. And when Paul writes that to the church of Rome, he says, listen, Caesar isn't your Lord. Jesus is. And we have this movement, this resurrection story take place. And the greatest proof of our gospels, believe it or not, is in the text. I can give you history, but it's actually right in the words themselves. These women become the first preachers, believe it or not. The first evangelists, believe it or not. And Luke gives the same list he gives in Luke 8. And it's this list. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the mother of James. Here's the problem. We're talking about a prostitute, a servant, and a poor widow. And they become the first messengers. See, The beauty of the story is God takes what's broken, restores it, and makes it beautiful. Now, we have a higher view of women by God's grace than the first century did. But in that culture, literally, the Greco-Roman worldview, and I don't have time to go through the slides, was that women were best silent and submissive, never speaking. Secondly, in the Jewish worldview, there was a morning prayer that was prayed after the Old Testament was sealed. It said this, God, I thank you that I'm not a slave. God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. God, I thank you I'm not born a woman. Women were so low on the totem pole that their testimony was not valid in court without two other witnesses. And here they are, our first evangelists. If this was a big hodgepodge story, guess what? They would have left the women out. Top that off, they wouldn't have died for a myth. The third, his brothers wouldn't have died for a myth. Two brothers we don't recognize, and we often ask the question, why is James and Jude in the Bible? They're not apostles. Well, actually, they're the brothers of Jesus. And they both start their letters saying that Jesus is Lord and don't even acknowledge that they're his brother. Something happened that day that changed the course of history. And something can happen today that will change the course of your life. Give your life to him. This morning, we're going to share a quick story of my friend Shane and his journey of what God has done in restoring a city as Jesus wants to restore your life. Here's a quick video from the Today Show. Let's watch together. Tomorrow will mark five months since the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California's history nearly wiped the mountain town of Paradise off the map. There's not much left in the Northern California community of about 26,000 people, many of whom have not returned and may never. But there are signs of hope and inspiration in the ruins of that tragedy. NBC's Steve Patterson has our Sunday Closer. High above what's left of paradise, after last fall's campfire burned nearly everything to the ground. It's hard to imagine you could ever find beauty again. But if you look closely, you might find it staring right at you. Paintings of beautiful women projected on the facades of ruins, all the careful creations of one man. I wanted something that definitely affected you emotionally. LA-based freelance artist Shane Grammer, who grew up outside of Paradise, says he was inspired to paint there because of one Facebook post, a lone chimney rising above the shredded remains of a friend's home. To Shane, it looked more like a canvas. Sometimes you just know, and a, you know, a gut reaction, I knew I needed to go paint that chimney. 
Armed with Kansas spray paint, he transformed a reminder of personal tragedy into what residents saw as a symbol of hope. And you weren't sure it was going to have any connection? Oh, heck no. Are you kidding? No, I didn't know how the community would respond at all. The response? Overwhelming. Residents so moved, they asked him to keep painting. It did move people emotionally. Uh, it, to me, that was a miracle. Proving that paradise could still be beautiful, even like this. At Hope Church, there wasn't much to work with. Remarkably, only a wooden cross still stands. But Shane found a way. It's special. Something inspirational in the middle of what seems, you know, so chaotic. Inspiration is found faded into the rusted ruins of a church baptismal, sun bathing on the side of a hollowed out shed, or spread across the shell of a burnt fan. In total, Shane has painted 17 murals, all with the blessings of property owners. Most so subtle, even haunting, they seem to blend in with all the chaos. What, yeah. What's the decision to do that? It was important to me that the, the work faded in, almost felt like it was a part of this environment. While most of his work is inspired by faith, portraits of women representing a song of Solomon, a love story from the Bible, others are more personal. Watch out for nails. Nicole and Greg Wedig lost their home, escaping with their child, Eleanor, who now looms over what's left, a reminder of their life here. She's looking up at it, at the future. What's your hope for paradise? They will rebuild, you know, they will grow again, they will thrive again. That's really the deep message, is that there's hope and there's life again. There's beauty, there's beauty among the ashes. For Sunday Today, Steve Patterson, Paradise, California. Let's welcome Shane together right now as he shares. So, uh, <clears throat> The Rock is home, you know, for my wife and I. I was going to The Rock before I met my wife. Missy, stand up, please. Yeah. She was the voice that said you'd have to go back to paradise after we um, just the response from people from is from paradise. Is there anybody here from paradise? I don't know. I, I put a Facebook post out there. Nobody. OK. Um. I'm the guy that cries at chick flicks, so uh, <laughs> I'm pretty emotional. I, I've watched all the Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's, I mean, yeah, okay. Um, you know, I, so I've had a lot of interviews. A lot of you know me, or your family here. You've known me for many years, and uh, you know how hard I've worked, uh, like a lot of us here, and I still have to work hard as a freelance artist. So I, I'm mainly in the theme park industry, so I do a lot of business development, but I know all aspects of fabrication of large scale environments that you see in major parks and attractions all over the world. So that's my day job that takes care of my beautiful family and our three girls. Um, and then just recently in the last year, I've been signed as a Disney artist for the parks in their galleries. And um, I have my first three paintings being released in, in Disneyland at the gallery in, in June. And then I, I love street, urban, modern art, contemporary work. And, uh, and that's really my heartbeat. And that's why I carry the title freelance because I don't want to work for anybody full time because I have to have some freedom to be able to do stuff that I did in paradise and what God has called me to do. Um, a few few things of backstories. I like to give the backstory of why. You know, a lot of people ask why would I do this, and I've told a lot of people, CNN and uh, New York Times, that it was another walk in the park for me. And the reason I say that is because when I was 19, you know, my first mural was in an orphanage in Mexico on a missions trip. Uh, a lot of missions trips are from this house, you know, Peru. I did a mural in a church no one will ever see. Uh, about three different orphanages throughout Ensenada and Tijuana. Uh, been to Brazil. Um, and then Clayton Butler, a lot of you know him, that worked in um, Agape International Missions in Swaipak, Cambodia, rescuing girls from the sex trade. And I went out there with a team and did mural work. And, 
And uh, so it, it's, and also inner city, San Francisco, youth with a mission, projects, things like that, doing a lot of uh, graffiti type of street art. That's just something that God has put really heavy on my heart. And the theme is really God has used me constantly my whole life to use the gift that he has given me to bring hope and joy to the downcast and brokenhearted. So paradise was just another, okay, yeah, dude, I got to rock that wall out. I got to hit it. And the funny thing is, uh, the guy that I painted on there, he's a Christian rapper. So he writes Christian uh, you know, music for rappers and he, and he does it himself. And I grew up with his wife. We went to the same church all through junior high and high school in Chico, California. That's where I was born and raised. And uh, I didn't, I, I, you know, I thought my mom was going to like it on Facebook, you know, and, and, and a handful of my friends. I've got great followers. Um, but when I went up there and painted that mural, I, I got the kind of typical response that I normally get, but it wasn't until the owner, Shane, of that house, he reposted uh, my post onto a Paradise Campfire Survivors website, and that's where it, it went viral, especially locally. And the thing that hit my wife and I were the comments that pe people from Paradise were um, posting, and it was... They have been so devastated and wiped out. Their whole community has been just completely destroyed. That that mural on Clark Road was one of the first glimpses of hope and beauty uh, through the experience that they went through, they, they're going through. And I didn't know this, but when I went into Paradise for the first time, um, I came a different way. But if you go up Clark Road from Oroville, it, it, right where I painted that mural, you come around a, a bend. And then, boom, she's looking, she's looking right at you. And there have been people that have just pulled over, wept. They've written poetry. People from all over the world have shot video, you know, documented uh, video, uh, documentaries. I mean, all kinds of stuff is going on um, from that. Uh, another backstory, which was mentioned in the story, um, is I've been working on a series called The Bride for about 16 years, all based off of Diane... Diane Hallam, who is now Parnell, and most of you know Diane Parnell, and she has, uh, God has used her to kind of really do this extensive um, story on the depth and the allegory of the book of Song of Solomon, of really the king, king's heart is for his beautiful bride, which the woman in my paintings represents us, mankind, God's bride. And so prophetically, you know, it's a very deep message, even though, you know, I'll tell people, I'm not the guy that holds this sign on the corner and says, Jesus saves, but I do it in different ways. And uh, I, I, and it's really cool, um, just, I, I mean, literally, the New York Times, in the last three months, New York Times, Washington Post, Inside Edition, NBC, uh, Ron Howard, I shot with Ron Howard's team, they're shooting a documentary, um, um, Stanford, there's people from Stanford and um, uh, Notre Dame uh, that are doing documentaries on the whole mural project. And uh, I, I, just been, I, I just been completely blown away and moved by what God has done and how he has escalated it to this area, Northern California, but it's throughout the U.S. and, and global, Australia, Switzerland, U.K., Turkey, um, they've, they've done videos and reposted. It's really impacted and touched people's hearts deeply. Um, do you want to ask me questions? That might help me. <laughs> this, this, I got to say, this guy is like a rock star when it comes to speaking. I, he, can't, he, he doesn't even take a breath. He just, <laughs> you're amazing. <laughs> so I want to just, just say this. Uh, I know Shane, it's almost 20 years, man. So Shane and I can, can talk for days just about what yeah. Bad stories. We will not do those stories today. But Jane was, Shane was our junior high director uh, for several years until God called him to L.A. into full-time artwork. Uh, but that being said, I, I think this is the picture and why it was important today when I got word of this. Um, there are times when God forms us in our brokenness, and Shane and I, we would yell at God in the car together. We were mad, praying for our wives to come in our singleness. I swear to you, Bonita parking lot. 
but we would pray and believe. And, and what I love, and you see in Shane's art, is the brokenness is in the painting because the brokenness is the bride, but it's also his brokenness that Jesus has restored. That's why there's depth there. Someone can re-sculpt that, but there's not the essence of a story inside. And that's the beauty of this here. Um, so Shane, just in closing, I would just say, what would be your message to many of us with our brokenness in our lives? What can you see Jesus do as you've seen him do through this mural project? Sure, yeah. My, uh, and, and a lot of my healing came because of this house, because of Francis uh, sending me saying, dude, you need counseling. And... Uh, <laughs> This is before I met my wife, and I'm like, dude, you're right. Um, and I spent five years in professional Christian counseling just getting whole and learning how to be whole and transparent and have uh, intimacy, you know, relational intimacy. Um, my real dad died from a heroin overdose. My stepfather was a raging alcoholic. My mom married him when I was two. Uh, he despised me because I was from another man. And then three, year, three years later, they have my younger brother, and my younger brother was my dad's new beginning. So I never really learned to experience intimacy with, um, you know, my dad or a man of authority inside of the home. I was just like, at a young age, I was a good kid, but I was like, peace out. I'm, you know, I'm going to go stay, stay the night at friends, I play basketball, skateboard. I need to get away from my, my family because it wasn't safe and I didn't feel like um, I belonged. And really my core issue is it always goes, I feel like I'm bad, something's wrong with me because he loves my brother more than he loves me. And as God started to restore, heal me, you know, that what I'm painting is maybe the way I'm feeling, but it's also in my own brokenness, and it's also the challenge to my own heart that God loves me. Uh, he is a loving father. I am his bride, um, which is really hard to, to grasp that at times, you know, so I'm still learning that. Um, and, and I think, you know, for me, uh, God has used me for years because I'm so passionate about artwork and I step out in it because I really, because I have to, I'm compelled, um, is that my life and the actions, really, I see God inspiring a lot of people, especially Christians. I feel like there's a lot of fear to step out in the creative world, um, believing that God call, you know, caused you to be that way or created you to be that way. So... What I tell people is God created me to be a creator. And, and my, the last thing I would want to say is just encourage other creators, creatives out here that God formed you that way before you were born. He put that deep fire, that passion within you, within your heart to step out. You know, it's like people like Bob. You know, Bob loves to go overseas and to do missions and you know, I love to do art, you know, graffiti, street art. You know, it's totally out of the box, but God's using it, using it in a mighty way. And there's just so many industries in the creative that I feel like Christians should be leading, um, and not even for leadership purposes, but just because you're so passionate and so moved and moved by the Holy Spirit that it just opens up doors and you make an impact and you change lives. Yeah. Come on, stand together. Let's give it up for Shane. I know you guys have lunch brewing. Um, let's extend our hands out towards Shane. There's an opportunity. We're going to pray that it will happen. Missy, come up as well. Uh, he may be able to paint the ruins of the Notre Dame Cathedral. So uh, let's just believe for God's favor. Uh, here's the beautiful thing about Shane. He's been doing this stuff when no one noticed for years. And he painted that without any expectation. And as we were praying this morning together, we just reminded of that parable of the talents. God gives these different people talents, and then when they do well, he gives them cities. And God gave Shane a city with a talent. Let's believe for some more cities. Let's believe for L.A. Let's believe for those other places. Extend your hands, and prayer team, come forward as well. Father, we just thank you so much for Shane. We thank you for the mission's call in his life. We thank you for Missy, an amazing woman that loves you well and has stewarded the heart of her husband well as he stewards hurts. And Lord, we just pray right now for favor as... Lord, you may open up this cathedral. But God, the bottom line is there's brokenness and ruins everywhere. And God, I thank you for my missionary friend and his wife. I thank you for this couple that is called to see great work done on behalf of your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, anoint them, fund them, 
bless them. Lord, we as a church stand behind them. Lord, we know that they live in L.A. now, but our heart is with them still. And we thank you for this reunification that took place. So, Lord God, do an amazing work in our midst. We're excited for the journey ahead for this family. In Jesus' name, amen.